So to give you a little bit background about myself, I was born in Tehran, Iran. Uh, I spent most of my childhood in Germany. Uh, back then it was West Germany. Uh, and then in Southeast Asia, then went back to Europe shortly before moving to the United States. And that's step six when I moved to New York. So, and I have been in the US uh, uh, for most of my adult life. And I'm currently, uh, as, as, as Dean Gottman mentioned, in Columbus, Ohio, which is my step 12. Um, so when, you know, when, when I was a child, my father took me to Esfahan, a city in the center of Iran that was once the capital of the Persian Empire and is known for its grand boulevards, magnificent palaces, and historical monuments. We walked through a narrow street that led to an old decrepit building built in the 17th century that had the name Garma Bey Sheikh Bahai inscribed above its door. It was a bathhouse named after its architect, Sheikh Bahai. He told me what was special about the building was that the water of the entire bathhouse used to be heated by a single ever burning candle and no one knew how it worked. And apparently the candle was burning for a long time, almost 300 years until a group of people trying to solve the mystery demolished a part of the building to access the furnace. The candle went out and they were never able to turn it back on. I was so fascinated by that story. And for months, I couldn't stop thinking about a single candle somehow defying all the laws of physics and heating an entire bathhouse. It was like architecture producing a kind of magic. And it was in fact, during that time, when I decided that I wanted to be an architect. I came to understand architecture as a field that combined art and science to create innovations and meaningful and often mysterious connections between bodies and the environment. And growing up, my dream was to study architecture and to live in New York City, which is why when I finished high school, I packed all my things and I basically came here. Um, and for me, this was truly a magical experience. And this is not just because my school looked like Hogwarts, but, and at the time, actually architecture school was in Shepherd Hall, but also because I felt like I'm in an environment where I can finally pursue my dreams and surrounded by people who are, who are always there to support me. And being at City College, I think for me, more than most of my classmates was also an introduction to American culture, uh, to both New York culture, but also a global and international culture. And to be quite honest, in the beginning, it was difficult for me to distinguish those from one another. And at times I found myself looking and searching for, for America. But at some point I realized that's actually the most valuable thing about this place, that you, can sim you simply cannot separate those cultural identities and values. And that's what made City College especially unique environment, that there was this diversity was not just of cultural backgrounds, but also of thoughts and ideas. And to this day, the lessons I learned during those years, the friends I made, the teachers I met, and the values that I came to cherish has continued to stay with me. So to do a quick flash forward, in 2012, I started my own design office, Anonymous, with my partner, Marta Novak. And we were both interested in exploring new possibilities with, within architecture. Uh, and having worked in multiple offices, especially a few corporate ones, we wanted to go beyond the idea of architecture as a passive container of activities and to think of it as an active participant in human interactions. And one aspect we focused on specifically, especially in those early years, was the relationship between architecture and technology. Now, the very first project or the first built one we did was a small dental clinic in Woodland Hills, California. 
Now, I don't know if you've been to a dentist recently, but I think no matter what the space looks like, probably what you remember the most is, is this thing. This is the generic drop ceiling, usually a two by two or a two by four grid that has become a standard feature of most offices, clinics, or even classrooms and other spaces. But the suspended ceiling is actually quite an interesting thing. And I mean, it accommodates lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, acoustics, fire extinguishing, and various other functions or services that can simply be plugged into it. And it does that all within a same flexible system. In fact, in 1962, architecture historian Rene Banham called the suspended ceiling a utopian or a Dymaxian dream. He wrote, altogether, suspended ceilings represent probably the greatest achievement to date in accommodating technology to architecture. And yet, despite its remarkable all-pervading presence, in Banham's view, the suspended ceiling had been unremarked in the mythologies of modern architecture. He wrote, no one is for or against the suspended ceiling, and yet they constitute one of the most sophisticated elements in the technology of architecture. Now, 60 years since Banham wrote these words, we all know not much has changed. And we thought for this project, it may be the time to revisit the suspended, the suspended ceiling. So we, the budget was very low and we decided to use the existing T-bar aluminum ceiling system. And uh, if you, the T-bar system has a two foot groove spacing in the main T's and these two foot cross T's. So we use that to create a new triangular grid which basically measured two feet by four feet and four feet on either sides. And then we infilled it with a series of vacuum form acrylic panels. And the idea was to use the ceiling grid as a main organi organizing system for the whole office that actually defined the programmatic spaces uh, and, and various rooms. So the, there were actually five different unique types made of a combination of zero to three pyramids. And with the possibility of the panels being placed both facing up or down, you get about 10 different conditions. And of course, the idea was to have the fluorescent lighting behind the panels so that you distribute light evenly, but also beyond the lighting or formal aspects it was also to, to be able to accommodate those various functions, ventilation or sound through these special panels. We actually had to design a special adapter because we realized that the ducts are circular and we had to connect the circle now to the triangle and, um, and the, the whole making it work was a fun, fun, fun exercise. So you see here again the image of a typical patient exam room and, and the drawing. And again, just like the ceiling system is a standardized and uh, you know, modular system, we wanted to, to be able to think of the rooms in a similar way as some form of a modular system that can essentially grow and adjust based on the size of the office. The other aspect about the project was that reception waiting area. We had very little room to fit reception desk or waiting room furniture. So we decided to accommodate it all within a single piece. And the this piece was consisted of about 600 CNC cut panels. And you can see in the drawing how the sectional variations allow it to transform from a reception counter and business area and desk for the staff to the seats and benches for the patients. And the geometry was essentially driven from these, the intersection and interweaving of these two volumetric systems, one corresponding to the business area and the function of the staff, and the other to the waiting area and that of the patients. And through this programmatic and geometric mediation, the furniture provided different standing, sitting, or relaxing positions. And in some way, tying the working posture of the office staff to that of the waiting 
patients in the waiting area. One of the aspects that we were really interested in here was the relationship between architectural and medical modes of representation. Now, X-ray imaging is, is one of those things. And when we did this drawing, we wanted to represent the place in the same way as an X-ray image does, in a way allowing us to see through. And then we thought, to, and then we thought, why not just use the X-ray? So we built a scrappy model uh, in the office using materials we could find, and started taking X-ray images of it. And we kept going back and forth, changing the materials or various things to make them more or less visible in the X-ray images. And then here it's interesting because the visible colors or appearance of the materials didn't really matter as much, um, but it, what mattered was how they appeared in the X-ray image. And, and, and this was, you know, I would say it wasn't really a successful experiment for us, partly because our choice of materials were limited but also because we only had access to a small dental x-ray and not large enough to really capture the full even the full model um but about a year after the project was finished i came across this 3d scan of the office the, the project in actually in the client's website and this is a standard nowadays standard uh 3d scanning done by matterport media that begins to show the office in, you know, in a digital model that you can obviously go on the website and, you know, or on your phone or on a computer and maneuver. And what's interesting about that is, is especially for projects like ours, that I would say they're born digital, meaning they're designed and modeled using, for first, designed and modeled using various digital modeling software and then drawn, annotated, and printed on paper before being physically built. This reproduction of the digital model from the physical space somehow brings that whole translation process into a full circle. But it also reveals the many anomalies, glitches that regularly emerge in the production process as the architectural object migrates from one software to another or from one mode of representation or one realm of reality to 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 the next and these are the same type of errors that we as designers have become so accustomed accustomed to concealing or correcting throughout the design and construction process from the rough edges the distorted geometries and the floating surfaces to the blank voids of hidden spaces, the frozen views on the windows, even the mechanics of viewing and maneuvering the interior on a small on a smartphone or or a computer. But these errors and glitches are also the traces of the design and production process. And for me, they are, they are perhaps maybe the best representation of the project. Now, during this time, we also began working with individuals and companies that shared our interest in technology and innovative approaches towards architecture. And one of these uh, companies was Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, which we've been working as their design partner since 2016. Hyperloop, as some of you may know, is a new transportation system that relies on a, on a capsule levitating in a vacuum tube that then allows it to travel at the speed of sound. Now, so there are three essential components to the system. There's the capsule that carries people or objects. There's the vacuum tube that the capsule travels in. And there's the hub or terminals that are basically connection between um, the, the tubes are connecting to. And we were involved in, in all those three areas. And essentially we had to imagine an entirely new system of travel and passenger experience. And one, one of the challenges, for example, here was the design of the capsule itself. For example, because the capsule is inside a sealed vacuum tube, it cannot have the regular windows uh, as in a train or an airplane. So thinking about the interior, we did multiple proposals, starting with a more 
I would say, conservative approaches here that imitate essentially the travel experience in a plane or a train, but replace the windows maybe with an interactive screen. But then we went further and tried to take advantage of the closed interior to create an immersive experience and that you can customize that experience using, using the digital screens. Um, but also take, the, take a new approach to the problem of seating. So considering both individuals or families and groups that will be traveling and creating a seating configuration that you could ad adjust on, on the basis of who you're traveling with and the level of privacy you, you, you like. My favorite one is what we ended up calling the standing capsule or you could call it the, the subway capsule. This, this one was designed for short trips. And you know the idea was that you, you would get on and off, you may be there for only a minute or so, and some people may not decide to sit. Like I was one of those people who always leaned against the door in the subway in New York. So the idea here was to, to take advantage of the circular interior of the capsule to allow the seats to be adjusted. And this not only allowed us to adjust the seats for various size of individuals from children to adults or people with varied heights, but also or to various postures, people who are leaning or sitting, but also to, to allow the seats to go up to the ceiling. So when someone's not seated, you're not looking at a blank seat, but could possibly be looking at, a, at an image or information on the screen. We also work with Hyperloop TT to develop a new tube and pylon system, especially in urban areas. And the goal was to really conceive the system, not just as another form of an elevated highway, which we already know the lessons of that, but really as a new form of urban infrastructure. So that not only carries capsules, but also people as a pedestrian network, elevated pathways, um, and, uh, and also on the ground level, it could provide an urban corridor for both pedestrians, cyclists, but also spontaneous street events, programs, or activities, depending on the neighborhood and communities it, 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 it intersects. But I would say the biggest challenge was the design of the hub or the terminal itself. Now, you have to imagine this is a building building type that has no precedent. So it's like designing the very first airport that could then become a standard for all the future ones. So our approach here was to basically take the turning radius of the Hyperloop tube itself as a starting point, which gave us a 300 meter diameter circle. And then the idea was, because it's a very large space, to bring the people into the center and then distribute them through various circulation means from the center to the gates back on the periphery. So the idea, again, was you arrive anywhere on the periphery of the circle, you, you enter the station or the terminal approaching the middle zone, which we had a kind of a large outdoor garden in the middle, and then we, you would then be taken to any of the three zones on the level above through these series of trifold ramps. And you can see here in, in, in the plans, this is the, depart, the departure level and the platform level that we were trying to use even the flooring pattern as a way of guidance and signage so that no matter where you enter the station, you would be guided to one of those three zones, designated zones that you travel, and then through the ramps up to the level above. But also not to think of the ramps simply as means of circulation, but also as places that could hold program itself, like security checkpoints or ticketing and certain things that you know usually we have to wait in line for. Um, so, so that it turns the station or the hub into a no-stop, uh, space where you don't have to actually stop and wait. And with the capsules arriving every 30 seconds, that was a really a big demand we had to address. Now, once you have that station module, it really doesn't matter much what type of skin or enclosure you, you place it in. And the idea was that it actually would, should have some flexibility. So depending on where it is, 
it could have a different exterior and skin responding to the city or area it's, it's cited. Um, the one we actually chose as the primary one was, was this skin, which basically it recognizes and acknowledges the various entrances, exits, and the various forms of penetrations in and out of the hop, including, of course, the Hyperloop tubes themselves, but also vehicular and pedestrian ramps and bridges that come in and out of the station and allow those to essentially form the design of, of the skin. So here's a rendering of, uh, let's say the main station uh, was designed for Abu Dhabi in UAE. And then you see the same module working in Al Ain in UAE as well. Um, but with a different uh, skin that allows the addition of additional support programs to to this to the circle to the donut, um, and the ground level and the central kind of garden was really thought to be a part of the community it sits and open to public and allow for kind of this this for various you know as a support uh, system and various for, for type of activities and events. This one in particular was designed by SWA, which we worked with. And uh, to really, again, think of the, the transit hub, not as a standalone space or a station, but as something that could actually uh, activate and bring in new type of events, activities, programs, and, and businesses to the, to, the, to the city and neighborhood it's cited. Now, to switch to a different project, we also collaborated with UCLA City Lab on a project for NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. Now, JPL, as you may know, is NASA's research and development center responsible for building and operating planetary robotic spacecraft, like the Martian rovers. And we were asked to redesign uh, JPL's existing offices in Pasadena, California. But when we visited their offices, we were surprised to find ourselves in a very familiar environment, a dull generic space filled with desks and cubicles, not unlike many offices you've probably experienced. And you know, it seems like no matter who we are and what we do, we all use the same reclining, same old desks that have been around for centuries and the same reclining chairs with tiny squeaky wheels. And it's funny because a lot of times the chairs don't even work on carpet uh, and we rely on these plastic pads to, to make them function. And I've been looking at actually pictures of presidents all the way uh, back and I'm amazed for someone who has custom designed cars and airplanes, we still haven't been able to solve the problem of the office chair sitting on, on the office floor. So anyway, so, you know, the first office chair actually belonged to Charles Darwin. Darwin manually attached wheels to the chair in his study so that he could move around his room and work between his desk and his specimens without having to get up. And throughout the much of the 20th century, we see a lot of architects uh, designing chairs that were essentially they were less interested in matching the chair to the body and its function than to their building. I mean, this is a beautiful chair by Frank Lloyd Wright designed for his uh, Larkin building. Uh, and uh, it was a three legged chair. And so many people uh, fell from it that it became known as the suicide chair. And, and, it's a, and later on, uh, he had to add a fourth leg, which you see on the image on the right to, to solve the problem. And while the type of activities we do in the office, even the devices and tools we use have changed significantly since Darwin's time, uh, the chair itself hasn't evolved much. I, I mean, we still use essentially the office chair is a chair with tiny wheels. And we realized that we could, before we could really reimagine the office environment, we really needed to rethink and redesign the office furniture. For us, furniture is architecture at a human scale. So we took inspiration from JPL's rovers 
spirit, opportunity, and curiosity, and designed our own office rover, which we called Productivity, which is basically an individual pod that can move around the office on its own. It provides privacy, but can also uh, plug into a desk for meeting or collaboration. But most importantly, since productivity has rover wheels, it can maneuver any terrain. And that enabled us to completely transform the interior environment. In fact, we were able to fit just as many, as many workstations as a traditional desk and cubicle, but with much more flexible and adjustable layouts. So here's how JPL's offices look like. And, and this is what we proposed uh, to them. Um, we even put uh, Matt Damon from Martian on the far left of the image. But again, it doesn't matter what the office looks like. What matters is that the new system, the desk and chair or rover system allows us as architects to now envision any type of floor uh, and any terrain and rethink the office environment the way we, we want to and not be bound by the limitations of the furniture. Uh, but these ideas also are not limited to the use of, in this case, advanced technology like JPL's rovers. For a long time, I've been very interested in the modernist chairs using tubular steel and like those by Le Corbusier, Marcel Brewer, or Mies van der Rohe. And, you know, despite their scale, these chairs often combine aesthetic principles with highly technical details, which has to do with the use of the materials, but also the entire manufacturing process in forming, forming them. Like, for example, here you see a patent of Mises chair filed in Berlin in 1928. And because of this kind of bipolar quality of being both an aesthetic object, but also a technical object, these chairs became a source of legal disputes between designers and manufacturers, like the dispute between Marcel Brewer and Mart Stamm, or between Anton Lawrence and the Thonet Furniture Company in 1929, or between Mies and the German manufacturer Mauser in 1936, they all reveal the difference between the technical versus aesthetic approach towards furniture design. Now, one of my favorite pieces of furniture is, is this chair designed by Everest and Jennings, which is the first collapsible wheelchair. And what this allowed is using tubular steel allowed Everest and Jennings to suddenly conceive the wheelchair as something that could be collapsed and folded so that you could now put it in the trunk of a car and take it anywhere. And it wasn't just the fact that the chair could be now mobile and transportable, but the wheelchair being mobile and transportable made the individual using it also mobile and transportable you know, transportable, so that the individual was no longer tied to the home or place the wheelchair was, but now could go anywhere and, 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 and move anywhere in, in anywhere within a car's reach, I guess. So uh, when we were asked to design a flexible uh, and moving furniture for, for NASA JPL, we basically took took our four favorite chairs you see on the left and placed them around the circular frame. So not only you get to use the original chairs by just turning the wheel, but also infinite number of possibilities in areas between them so that you could create your own posture and, and, and find your own comfort position. And the idea was that this would be a, a modular system where you could move it around the campus in JPL and use it either as a single unit for an individual activity, work or relaxing, or bring them together for meetings and collaborations. We call it zero gravity because it only balances with the weight of a person inside. There's a direct physical dependency between the body and the piece where the two balance and complete each other. And the chair has been 
uh, going around the country, actually, it's been featured in, in a few exhibition uh, and, and shows around uh, from in LA and Las Vegas, more recently in Columbus. Uh, here's a photo from an exhibition in Architecture and Design Museum in Los Angeles. You actually see Sylvia Levin um, sitting on the chair on the right. And it's interesting because no matter where we are asked to exhibit the piece, while everybody else's artwork is placed in these large, fragile, kind of protected boxes, we just roll in and out. <laughs> and it's quite fun to both move it and, and use it. Here's also a miniature version of zero gravity, which we uh, we, we, we did uh, especially for uh, A plus D museum. And this was part of the impermanent collection at the museum. And I was told it was recently uh, sold in an auction. Now, throughout all these projects, I had been thinking about the mysterious candle and in the bathhouse. And a few years ago, I came across an article that claimed to have finally solved the mystery. It described that recent renovations have revealed that the boiler was made of gold, a great conductive material, which explains the bathhouse's efficient heating system, but also why they kept it a secret so no one would steal the gold. But it also described a network of ceramic pipes that connect the furnace all the way to the sewage. This meant that the candle had a constant supply of biogases like methane and sulfur oxides that could keep it burning forever. So when the candle mysteriously went out, it was because the bathhouse had to be closed for repair, therefore no one was using the toilets and hence no fuel. Now, this new revelation not only solved the bathhouse mystery, but made it a lot more interesting to me. Now, the use of biogas as fuel is not unprecedented, but what made the bathhouse especially unique was that it placed those engineering innovations in a direct dialogue with human bodies and their use of space. Suddenly, the building's mechanical system and the body's metabolic system merged and became one a self-sufficient closed system. And yet it wasn't just a direct interaction with the body and the building. The architecture also created interesting, even if absurd, connections between various individuals within the building. One person's waste became the fuel for another's warm bath. Now, this interest in the relationship between the body and the building also led me to the study of hospitals. In fact, hospitals from the time they emerged as medical institutions in the 18th century, they were viewed as therapeutic machines. And in fact, most were designed by doctors rather than architects. This was because of a widespread belief at the time that diseases were caused by miasma or a form of foul air and the only way in the absence of medication or anesthesia to enable surgery, the only way to remedy and prevent the spread of infectious disease was to provide and tackle the problem of ventilation. So even by the end of the 19th century and the emergence of germ theory of disease, we see that ventilation continues to determine the design of the hospitals. Uh, architects even referred to their buildings as a machine for cure. So this allowed, this presumed relationship between the environmental condition and health allowed doctors and medical professionals to extend their expertise and even authority to architecture. Now, medical professionals uh, like Florence Nightingale, Thomas Kirkbride, and later John Shaw Billing, they wrote extensive treatises on the design and construction of hospitals, advocating, for example, for separate wards with access to natural light, ventilation, fresh air, even the idea that picturesque views of landscapes could, could, could improve treatment or even cure of illness. And these treatises, they were actually uh, very detailed. And you can see here in the list, 
in the table of contents, they discuss like things like not just the size and shape of the rooms, but also supply of water, drainage, you know, the the floors, doors, locks, windows, and stairs essentially very specific architectural details that, that are all uh, prescribed here. So by the 19th century, uh, we have the emergence of a standard building type, building type or typology, is, which is, became known as the pavilion plan. You can see here in Duran's uh, drawing from 1801, on the right you see a pavilion plan. This is Duran's own proposal for a hospital, which is basically a series of uh, a series of single story or low rise buildings uh, arranged, you know, spaced apart uh, and arranged in a larger campus with obviously landscape in between to allow for natural light and air for each pavilion. Now, I want to focus on one of those uh, hospitals. Uh, which is the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, completed in 1889. This is this is actually a, 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 a this is a project that I spent the past six and seven years, six to seven years, researching on for my doctoral uh, studies. Now, you can see, you know, and and I think it reveals this intertwined relationship between architecture and medicine during this period. Now, if you look at the design process, you, we see the professional dynamics and bribery between medicine and architecture in the, uh, at the time when they were both in the early stages of their professionalization in the United States and in a subject, the hospital, in which both professions claimed expertise and authority. Now, this project was largely led by a doctor named John Shaw Billings, who approached it as a technical scientific problem. Of course, building was influenced by the rise of, the, uh, of, of laboratory and experimental methods in medicine. And we can see here the application of a scientific method to architectural design. So he began by doing an extensive research through literature reviews, visit to, to existing hospitals, even meeting and talking to experts on the field. Then he developed a series of hypotheses, design hypotheses. And then he even tried to test those through a series of experiments. But Billings wasn't able to emulate the real life condition of a hospital ward in a laboratory environment. And part of that is because to emulate that means you have to, a hospital ward you have to rely on living, breathing patients, which obviously he didn't have access to. So instead, what did he do? He decided to build the hospital ground up with the intention of using it as a full-scale architectural experiment, what he called a laboratory for heating and ventilation. So each building was designed with a different form and layout and, and with a different and unique heating and ventilation system. And the idea was that once the hospital becomes operational, he would be able to correlate the environmental performance of his systems with the condition of the patients in each ward and therefore arrive at the best architectural solution, what he considered a perfect system of ventilation. Basically seeing which patients in which ward did better or did worse using human living humans as lab experiments and, and, and by that uh, arriving at the best design configuration. There were also very interesting architectural details. I mean, uh, you can see the details, some of those drawn on the drawing on the left, on the top, the rounded corners to facilitate airflow and cleaning, self-closing doors to control air circulation, bathrooms on wheels, to avoid plumbing and building cavities, places where germs would, would harbor, even perforated floors and ventilated ceilings so that no particle or germ from one person would ever reach another. And 
in some ways very much in line with the octagonal chapels of 15 and 16th centuries or the 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 jeremy bentham's panopticon of the 18th centuries we see the the octagonal ward in the Johns Hopkins Hospital, the drawing on the right, Jeremy Bentham's panopticon, obviously on the left. The octagonal ward reflected the new disciplinary order where a 15th, 16th century spiritual order or the 18th century civic authority or what Foucault called economy of visibility is now substituted with a medical authority with thermal and environmental control. And the ward, the octagon ward, allowed all beds to be at equal distance from the windows and the peripheries and equal distance to the ventilation tower in the center. That tower in the center, the, the sort of the watchtower of the panopticon is now replaced by a ventilation tower in, in the hospital ward. And this provided greater amounts and even more, and, and more even distribution of light and air, even increased the area per bed. But its biggest drawback, ironically, was that the ventilation tower at the center hindered visibility. Meanwhile, as the first institution to combine a hospital with a medical school, which John Hopkins was the first in the United States, the educational ambitions of the project also extended to its architecture. To that end, all pipes, ducts, traps, and mechanical apparatuses were exposed to view on purpose so that the hospital would function as a didactic demonstration of the experiment. Billings called it a laboratory for teaching the practical application of the laws of hygiene to heating, ventilation, house drainage, and other sanitary matters. Even the nurse's training course began with topics on air and ventilation, lectures like physical properties of the atmosphere or practical methods of studying ventilation. And only after the first six weeks of instruction, once they were equipped to, to operate the ventilation system of the hospital, the nurses were introduced to subjects like the digestive system. And a key ingredient of this project, again, as an experiment, as an architectural experiment, was, was of course the observation and documentation and record keeping. Now, you can see here a sample form uh, for inspection, uh, and uh, you can see the list of things that the inspector was supposed to inspect. You start with the general condition of the work, ventilation, floors, bathrooms, laboratory, and at the very end, you see the condition of the patients. So this resulted in the isolation and abstraction of specific components and conditions of architecture that allowed them to become, to become objects of scientific study and analysis. And, and this meant that architectural components and those performances suddenly participated uh, in the production of scientific knowledge through various reports, papers, and publications that came out of the hospital in the first uh, few years after it was finished. But also, if you look at the interiors, in a period when American architects are embracing the revival of classicism and the aesthetic principles of Ecole de Beaux-Arts, the adoption of hygienic and antiseptic principles here resulted in bright, sterile interiors with smooth, impermeable surfaces, exposed pipes and ducts, and no cornices or ornaments to hold germs or, or foul air. And this was a very different approach to the, to, to the approach they took to the exterior facade of the buildings that were highly ornamental. Billings believe that the project should be worked out in plans before any attention is given to the exterior elevations. And while he was busy working out the plans and sections with the engineers, the architects that were brought into the projects were only asked to design the exterior facade and only of the three buildings facing Broadway. And the only drawings they provided were elevation drawings of just the facades. So 
the modern appearance of hospitals and medical facilities during this area, this era in the late 19th centuries, inspired many 20th century architects like Le Corbusier, Alvaro Alto, Richard Neutra, etc., who saw this sterile and hygienic appearance as an image that instilled a sense of health and well being. But rather than an aesthetic or symbolic representation, these characteristics were the expression of inherent functional and didactic qualities of architecture that were uniquely modern. And it was architecture's interaction with these new conditions of modernity in the medical hospital that constituted as modern, not simply because of its appearance, but sometimes in spite of it, as you saw with the elevations. And I think that's something that has largely been overlooked in, in the history of architecture and especially modern architecture. But you know, another aspect that I think Billings experiments begin to show is the limitations of conventional representations of buildings that often assume architecture to be a fixed, static, solid object or container. We, we often use conventional static orthographic drawings in 2D to, to represent the dynamic three-dimensional conditions like the movement of air, sound, light, but all in, in, in 2D static drawings. And this is why in my teaching, I explore new tools and representational techniques that allow us to not only measure and draw, but also ultimately design around the movement and flow of these various things, usually various in invisible, mobile, or transient things that inhabit our buildings, gases, fluids, particles, but also people. In a studio, part of that exploration is the exploration of materials. In a studio I taught, I think, three years ago, I asked the students that the only building material they could use was water. Of course, water in its various forms. And you see two different approaches here. On the left is a group of students who use the, re the relationship between water and vibration and sound as a way to be able to control the behavior of moving uh, droplets. And, uh, and, and, and use that as a way to create space. And on the right, you see the idea of using water as ice and the process of both lighting and heating, which became one, to melt this, uh, the frozen soap water and automatically create these bubble enclosures that then they can move and interact with each other. And I think as architects, we're, becoming increasingly more responsible about the air inside mm. our buildings. And uh, this is a way to think about the, I, I would say the new responsibility of us as architects, especially after the pandemic, that no longer stops at the physicality of, of the walls or floors. And we need new modes of representation to make that expertise both more explicit, but also more teachable. And these are kind of using conventional disciplinary drawing techniques in attempting to do that. And these studies could inform the way we design buildings as well. You know, whether it's the movement of air or scent uh, within the spaces and how we identify various spaces and programs, or the idea of heating and cooling and using various forms of environmental control rather than walls or partitions to create space, or in this case, using sound, smell, and sight together to define and create relationships within various interior spaces in, in a building. Now, how does all that, how is that practical? Um, I actually happen to believe that a lot of these could be applied to the way we practice architecture and build real buildings too. We recently completed the first building of a medical campus, which we designed in North Rich Richland Hills, Texas. And the project is basically a three single story medical office buildings, uh, 24,000 square feet development, uh, sitting in a three acre campus 
all facing a shared public plaza. And when we first met with the client, he told us there are three priorities for, for him in this project. Number one, circulation efficiency. Number two, circulation efficiency. And number three, circulation efficiency. Now, the movement and interaction between doctors and patients, nurses and staff in a medical office is a highly complex routine. And what we learn is that we can neither rely on our naive assumptions about how people move and behave, nor do we have the means to test those conditions in a laboratory environment or a full-scale experiment, as in the Johns Hopkins Hospital. So taking advantage of recent uh, advances in simulation technology, we use software that can simulate the movement of people in a digital environment. We set up the main spaces of the clinic and ran the computer simulation multiple times. And each time the result, something like the image on the left, would show us the bottlenecks, traffic and congestion zones and would allow us to go back and make necessary adjustments like widening a door or a corridor or moving various spaces within the floor plan. And we did that multiple times to kind of essentially drive the design process and get the, the final layout. But the key here is that simulation here is not just used to test or validate a preconceived idea or design, but we wanted to use it as, as experimental design tools itself, as a form of mock-up or mini experiments that allows to do those experiments that used to be done in the outside world or in the laboratory, but now on, on a digital screen and in order to refine and test our hypotheses. We initially used the software called Pedestrian Dynamic, which these are crowd simulation software. So you typically, you know, the behavior of a crowd, everybody behaves differently. Like let's say in a stadium, everybody's trying to get out. And then we later use another software called AnyLogic. And this, was, this is an agent-based simulation software, which allows us to actually reprogram it. We, we allowed us to reprogram it and assign different behaviors to different agents. In this case, we had three agents. We had uh, the doctors uh, with their repetitive uh, behavior, the nurses, and the patients. And each, you can see kind of like the image, the screenshot of how each one of these agents are, are programmed. Now, um, again, this animation is meant to show the design process. And you can see, again, the idea was to consider the whole office as, as two zones. And in each zone, there's a clinical uh, area. And each clinical area houses or uh, two doctors, two practitioners. Each doctor has three assistants or nurses, and each zone has about eight uh, exam rooms for serving each doctor. And the staff areas were, were seen as an area in between these two zones, the middle ground, uh, where it's mostly for the use of staff and not the patients. But, um, and then the patients would arrive in this view from the top, which is the entrance and the waiting area. The way it works is you come in, you check in, as the patient's coming in ch and checking and waiting in the waiting area. Then a nurse would come call you and escort you to your exam room. Then the nurse would go get the doctor. They would come together with the doctor to see the patients. Then the doctor and the nurse leave, and then the patient leaves, then goes to the checkout, checks out and leaves the building. So you can see how the design for us really emerged through these simulated series of simulated experiments and iterations. But, but for us really beyond exploring new tools or even representational techniques, our goal was to consider architecture beyond the passive container as a framework that can improve the pattern of relations in space. Um, 
here's a plan of the the main building the dermatology clinic where you see again the two clinical zones the lighter floor the flooring actually differentiates the the, the private staff versus public patient zones and you see here and i want to draw your attention to the concentric arrangement of the clinical zones i don't know if you see my cursor i will just try to do that so again at the very set and this this is not only defining the circulation pattern and a system of visual but also a system of visual communication and surveillance between doctors nurses and patients it is designed literally as a kind of a panopticon within a panopticon so you have the doctor's offices in the middle overlooking the nurse stations and the nurses and then the nurses here in the nurse station looking at the patients and the exam rooms now for us the design of the facades the facades really were a form of orthographic representations we we had to use a masonry material this was a, required by the city and we decided to use a uh, thin brick or brick veneer but rather than trying to use the brick veneer to imitate brick we wanted to really expose the superficial material quality of the material so the the facades are literally orthographic oblique drawings of the buildings themselves drawn onto themselves so we use control joints as lines brick veneer walls as surfaces and these the ephes areas as openings or or cutouts and even it didn't make much sense for us to draw actual elevations because this the elevations didn't really correspond to the way they landed on the building so we we did this cut and fold sheet um, that shows the actual elevations and again rather than using the drawing as a way for people to look at it and and understand it visually we wanted people to be able to actually understand it by doing it so you can actually download this from our website print it at home and literally cut and glue it to make a mini paper model of the building and and the whole process of doing that for us was the best way to communicate the way the skin and the structure here behave we're actually shoot, doing a photo shoot this weekend which i'm super excited about so the images I'm going to show you, they're just iPhone photos of the building we have, the first building, which was completed. Again, you see the thin brick using very stacked or running bond patterns in both horizontal and diagonal arrangements that essentially conform to the drawn projections on the facades. And, and again, exposing the symbolic quality of the material as as what I call a non-brick. Essentially, it's a tiling system that only represents or imitates uh, brick. Here are a few other instances from around the building where you see the, the, the drawn projected surface wrapping around the corner um, um, and the various conditions it creates, the windows with the cutouts of the windows that don't match. Uh, but also kind of like how kind of the skin interacts with some of the strange and ubiquitous architectural components, in this case, the roof access ladder around the building. Uh, one of the instances I want to draw your attention to is the corner condition. Now, rather than considering the corner as the intersection of two flat surfaces, we actually wanted to have one of the projections happening right at the corner so you see here an axonometric projection of a box that's wrapping around the corner and it can only be viewed at that corner at that just perfect mo weird moment so ultimately the exterior facade function as a two-dimensional surface wrapped around the building shells that attempt to represent but never fully correspond to the logic of the interior and in doing so the project aims to reveal the disjunction between the interior and the exterior between the structure and the skin now remember 
the bathhouse and the elaborate heating and plumbing system that powered a single candle. Um, what if I told you that the story isn't true? <laughs> about a year ago, I decided to write about the building, thinking that just as it had inspired me throughout my career, it could do the same for others. But as I began my research, I discovered that the candle was really a torch. There was not one, but multiple boilers. And the connection between the sewage had never really been proven. Some have even argued that Sheikh Bahai is not the architect of Sheikh Bahai bathhouse. So the mystery was not a marvel after all. It was simply a myth. <laughs> now, you can imagine how deeply disappointed I was. But then I thought to myself, so what that it's not true? So what that the bathhouse wasn't actually heated by a single candle or fueled by biogases? It doesn't matter so much whether it did or didn't happen, but what matters more is that at its core, these imaginative solutions are possible. It is possible to have objects or furniture that can respond to and interact with our bodies. An office where the circulation is synchronized with the schedule and pattern of activities. Or a building where the switch can function as a fuel for heating. Now to me, architecture is the realm of those interactions. The disciplinary exchange of knowledge and expertise, the technical intervention, of tools, software, and modes of practice, and the physical interplay of objects, bodies, and particles in space. And oftentimes, it is also the difficult conciliation of reality and imagination. Thank you. Stunning, stunning talk, Iman. Really stunning. So beautiful. So, so, um, gosh, gosh, you know, you have, you make us proud, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So are there questions and comments for Iman? Folks in the auditorium, you can just raise your hand and it'll pick up. Iman, hi, this is Brad here. Hi, Brad. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, hold on a second. Um, first of all, uh, it's wonderful to see you. <laughs> and it's, um, I just want to echo Dean Gutman's uh, remarks. Your work is absolutely stunning. Um, it, it brought tears to my eyes uh, watching you present it and um, feeling incredibly proud uh, that, that myself, my colleagues had any influence on you whatsoever, that, that you have been able to go out into the world and do what you're doing. And uh, we're, we're incredibly proud of you. Um, I, I, I suppose I'll just start the questions um, with something that I took note of in, 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 in looking at your work and listening to you present, which is your capacity to move across uh, scales so uh, incredibly artfully uh, and to bring your intellectual project uh, uh, across that spectrum um, of, of project sizes, scopes, uh, types. And, and what I guess I'm curious about is what for you, um, how do you think about that shift in scale? When I think about you moving from a prosthetic device or a piece of furniture up to the scale of something like the Hyperloop or uh, uh, incredibly large sort of civic uh, or institutional uh, buildings, what for you remains consistent, let's say, creatively or intellectually across that spectrum? And, 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 and conversely, are there things that remain exclusive to, to either of those domains? 
um, I'm just curious about your, your process. And I say that because as we all know, um, there are designers who excel at doing one of those things or the other of those things. And when they are shifting in scale, they don't, they don't necessarily accomplish it. So I'm just curious, since you're doing both so well, um, just if you could reflect on that. Yeah, you know, of course, thank you, Brad. So good to see you here. Um, and thank you for your kind words. Um, I, uh, I think it's a good question. I have to say, I struggle with that. I, I, you know, doing an architectural degree, this is part of the reason I went and tried to do an urban design. I mean, I did an urban design degree because I felt like we were very good. We learned how to deal with one scale, but cannot really understand the urban scale and and what does that imply and i have to say i was part partially disappointed to find that there's really no manual of how to do that how to shift scales and uh you know like uh, urban designers planners at least the time i was in school were primarily interested in the urban scale uh architects at the building scale so and it was very difficult to even have these conversations between architects and urban designers when we were looking at a project to me what uh, ties at least helps me address those is is the human experience because i think that's something that transcends both scales and we always try to in our projects bring it start at the human experience and doesn't mean human scale it means human experience and then work our way up to the larger scale and this was the same thing we did with hyperloop uh, we tried to think of not just the interior of let's say the capsule but how does a person arrive and go through the station what do we want and we don't want and then look at the space and see how can we address that and how can we maneuver it now in terms of what's exclusive to those and I'm sorry, and part, partly that's why that's our interest in furniture comes in, because the moment we look at the human experience and scale, we realize Actually. along the way we have to rethink the furniture or we have to rethink the way we move in space or the modes of mobility before we can even rethink the building or, or the urban spaces. In terms of what's exclusive to those, that's a good question. I think I think that's part that's maybe a lot of the things that we already kind of uh, have have dealt with. I would say urbanism in general is 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 for me more about what's exclusive to urbanism, not architecture and are has been dealing with that. I think public and private become an issue when we're looking at the larger scale uh, and managing those modes of mobility become something that I would say in architecture or human scale we deal less with but in the urban scale becomes a major issue of how to think of how we maneuver and move throughout the space um and and of course now especially now environmental concerns become something that uh in in let's say in the building scale we're dealing with certain set of strategies energy efficiency and all of that and the building technology but in an urban scale, we're dealing with completely different ones and, and it becomes very difficult at times to, to use the same tools and methods to analyze and think about those. So I don't know if that answered your question, but um, I would say it's never easy for me. I, I, I appreciate your comments, but, um, and I have to say, I went from an interest in larger, bigger projects to really appreciating the minute details that go into the design of, uh, you know, small scale objects, furniture, even clothing, eyewear and prosthetics. And, and for me, that, that, that essentially is what ties us as human beings to the world and environment around us. It mediates our understanding to, to how this is how we understand the world. And even the, where we're this space we're right now in, the, the Zoom, um, you know, I, I like to think of this as architecture too. And, and I hope soon we have architects designing these rooms so they function better. 
and so so that that to me is the real kind of the, the real the, the real aspect i'm interested in and i hope i can i can um do more in that so iman if i may ask you a question of a of a biographical nature so you um I, I am saying I was first off just a just a comment to say that I never thought that the um, Kirkbride Asylum would end up being the, the ones that I mean I guess we can we can share the story that I told you never to, to share right yes yeah yes you can Sh share shall that. I tell it or you tell it no you can share <laughs> well we were um, when Iman was taking a theory seminar with me here at Spitzer in undergrad. We were we were reading Carlyani's work on the on on the Kirkbride asylums. It would, had just come out, and Amon was was what I don't know how, what you were in your fourth or fifth year here, and super interest became super interested in these buildings and these long linear asylums from the 19th century. And so you went and found one, and you not only went and found one, you went and and you went and found one that was abandoned, and then you went and and actually jumped the wall. That set that protected this asylum and went in and came back and made a presentation of your research, right? Which was to walk, wander into an abandoned building totally against the law and come back and share your work. So I anyway, maybe this is perhaps too much to share in a public public, but it was quite no, a it's quite, okay. moment, quite uh, a moment in the no, seminar. I that's true. I found one. It's called the Hudson River State Hospital, which is yeah. up in, uh, uh, now I forgot, it's not in, is it in Poughkeepsie? Uh, uh, but I took the train there. It was like almost three hour ride. And then I didn't have a car. So I walked another half hour from the station to the hospital. And I got there and there, it was, it was, it was closed but with a, with a, with a chain. And I figured I just spend four hours getting there and it's my whole project, uh, you know, and I'm not going to give up. I can't just go back. So I was like, what do I do? And I was like, you know, I have to do it. Uh, so <laughs> I, I went over the, uh, the wall and went inside. And you know what was amazing? I just want to say that the building had not been used for probably at this was 2007 and it wasn't used probably for at least 10 15 years so I found like Pepsi cans from the 80s forms and that it was like almost like everyone left and then they sealed the building it was really like a time capsule and and that was in itself that was also an interesting experience but yeah I shouldn't have done it please don't do that if you're listening <laughs> so the, part, the question I wanted to ask you is you had you did your undergrad career? You did your did a, 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 another master's, did another professional degree, a master's degree at Harvard, and then you started this amazing um, practice, right? Doing all this incredible work. So, what made you decide to go back to school for the third time? What was the um, what was the prompt that took you from a an exploding career with great clients, you know, and 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 funding for research for what we call design research? And then, and, 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 and in your case, serious design research. And yet then you decided to, to take another step uh, um, and, and try something new. What, what prompted that? Uh, good and difficult question to answer. I mean, I would say maybe the short answer is insecurity uh, or, uh, you know, like I felt like, no, I mean, to, to, to try to answer it more accurately is that um, I, there were a few things. I always, as you know, I always was interested in, in doing a history theory degree, especially a more rigorous program as a PhD. I wasn't 100% sure whether I want to be a full-time historian. In fact, I still struggle with that. And, you know, uh, and it's difficult because it's ma it's managing uh, two essentially full time careers, uh, you know, together. And e doing one alone is is difficult, as as, as you all know. Um, doing two, it's people tell me it's impossible. So uh, I think what prompted me was that despite the interesting projects, I felt like I'm not intellectually fulfilled. 
Um, I also felt like uh, I would like to know more. The more I practiced architecture, I became more interested in architecture and its own history. And I came to develop real deep appreciation for historical research and scholarship. And uh, I can't believe I'm saying it, but it took me a long time. But if you ask me now whether I enjoy more designing a building or a project than sitting and writing an essay, I have to say I'm at a point where I actually enjoy the writing more than drawing. And I never thought I would be that. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it, it, I feel like it's, it's some form of the practice is always difficult as, 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 as you all know, because you're always dealing with limitations, limitations of cost, uh, demands of a client, limitations imposed by the city, by, by the construction and uh, reality of construction and materials. Whereas in, in, in writing, there's no limits. Uh, I, and I feel completely liberated where I can actually explore ideas and I don't have to worry about whether the client will like it or not, whether the contractor can build it or not, whether it's too expensive or not. And, and that's what I think to me is the most valuable. And the second thing I would say is the audience. And, and, and if I can capture, and that's why I enjoy teaching. And part of the reason I went back to do a PhD was teaching. I benefited from uh, amazing teachers like yourselves, uh, and uh, and I realized the value of good teachers. And I think through writing and teaching, if I can uh, educate uh, the next generation of designers uh, who can do better than we have, then I would feel like I have made a bigger maybe impact than through my own work as, as a designer or an architect. So, so I think it was a combination of those, uh, all those things. That's, that's a beautiful answer. I thank you for that, for that honesty. And that, and that, um, are, are there other comments or questions? And yeah, I would. Um, hi, Iman. It's so nice to meet you and, and see your work. And you are just a stunning individual uh, and just a wonderful speaker. You're also, uh, I believe, are you at Ohio State? Mm -hmm. So you're that's that's my undergraduate alma mater. Uh, so a that. shout out there. <laughs> uh, and I guess I was thinking about I was thinking about um, a couple of things. One. Um, you know, when we talk, think about urban design and something like the Hyperloop, uh, but maybe even also your teaching, I'm curious how your experience in a city like Columbus, Ohio, has affected your thinking on kind of larger American questions of American urbanism and some of these scales of design, like the Hyperloop. Um, uh, thank or just you, even any reflections you have from your time in that part of the country. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It's a very difficult question. So <laughs> I'm gonna totally fail on this one. But um, I, I've been here only, um, I would say about six, six, seven months since, since August. So, and you know, I'm still figuring that out. I mean, to, to really be honest, I'm still figuring it out. I've never lived in the kind of middle America, Midwest has its own culture, obviously. I've been mostly on the East and West Coast. So, but I have to say as someone who grew up or spent most of my life in large big cities and urban areas, I've, I've really always, you know, dreamed of and, and, and I still cherish the kind of the more suburban environment here. And as, as an urbanist, I shouldn't be saying that, I guess, because suburbia has gone through its own uh, thing, but, but I love it here. It's great, especially in, for, for people in, in my, my age and family situation. Uh, it, it is an environment where for the first time I actually know my neighbors, they uh, interact with, with, with us, uh, you know, we meet, uh, there's a sense of, community and then I have to say despite I lived in great cities um, I never experienced that sense of community we design cities and we say it's community community but like 
really to experience it, uh, it, it it's it's a different thing. And 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 I have to I learn to to appreciate certain things that do and do not work. You know, obviously Columbus is a very unique example. They, as you know, they call it the biggest small town in America. So I would say it's the first city that I actually, because I've been observing different cities and I lived in, 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 in different, uh, within different areas of large cities from the center to peripheries and suburbs. And I have to say, it's, it's one of those cities that I feel like it actually works really well at the scale it is now. Like you, cause you get both an urban experience at the center, but also a workable, you know, uh, suburban environment uh, without dealing with a lot of the problems that other cities are dealing with. So maybe it's the scale, maybe it has to do with its history and culture, um, but, but somehow I, I'm interested in learning more about, uh, you know, why is it that it actually works so well in my view and, and what are the challenges? There are a lot of challenges. I mean, what part of the uh, Hyperloop actually, as you saw with the posters, they are doing a big push to, to use, you know, the, the area, the Great Lakes and Midwest as a as one of the primary areas they could start and grow because also i think that the population centers are are more ideal here and the distances are also closer so you can build a network easier um and um there's a lot of opportunities uh, as you know osu doesn't have an urban design program um but i have been starting to kind of talk to uh, faculty in planning and landscape to see if we could start to do maybe urban design studios. This is something that uh, the school is interested in pursuing, but so far they didn't have anyone to, uh, to lead that effort. So I'm hoping this could be maybe a new initiative that we need to, begin to, to investigate with other faculty and students. But yeah, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll, we'll probably have, have a lot more to say about it. Yeah, so yes, and, we look and, forward to yeah, talking to you about it and, and give me the give me the inside the inside scoop on these big uh regional transit uh imaginaries thanks for the thanks for answering the question what do you feel was like the turning point you know in, in your in your profession in your career that you can you know give uh to the hearing or to the audience as to you know what what you think changed for you um you know being uh, more successful, I guess, than, than others uh, in regards to, you know, performing your work and putting your ideas out there, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. And also, what message do you have? Because, you know, this is unexpected, right? As somebody that graduated from City College and you see all this success and now, you know, lecture, which is, you know, sort of like, I would say, you know, an amazing, you know, turn of events like a, he came to a full circle. So I just have that message and if you can answer that question for me and for I guess everybody else in the audience. Thank you, uh, Romel. So, so good to, uh, I don't see you, but hear you. And, uh, you know, I think I would say um, part of, uh, you know, one of the most important things I took from City College where my my classmates and friends. And, uh, you know, most of them, they became lifelong friends. And those type of friendships, you know, we practically lived in, in that studio, uh, especially in Brad's studio. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember we even, we had an air mattress next to a bandsaw that we purchased because the shop would close at seven. And, and that kind of wood dust in sleeping there it was you know we 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 yeah so we, we we really lived together for five years and and those friendships are 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 really something that um have for me been has been very valuable and i cherish and continue them uh so uh romel to answer your question i, I have to be honest i mean i i had this conversation uh, a few weeks ago with someone and um i Success is a strange term. I actually don't consider myself successful. I don't think I ever will. I don't know what determines it. 
but I think at any stage, what I learned is that any stage in one's career, you always are looking ahead and maybe you're always comparing yourself who are ahead of you. Uh, and you always are striving uh, and pushing for to do more. So I, I, I appreciate that. I have to say, I, I don't feel successful. I still am struggling every day uh, to figure out what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I have to give a talk and I have to think like, what do I tell them I'm doing? You know, and I have to make sense of all these things I'm doing and try to see if, if it even makes any sense. So from the outside, it may look, you know, polished, uh, but I have to say from the inside, it always is a struggle and I expect it to be a struggle, um, you know, for a long time, probably forever. Um, and, and I, and I think others, other people go through the same, same thing too. So I would say there was no point where I thought I kind of turned a corner. I'm still trying to get there when I do, I'll let you know. Um, but I have to say, I think for me, it was, uh, you know, it was a more gradual understanding, you know, uh, going, being there at city college, you know, it was was one step going to grad school suddenly I was exposed to a different culture different ways of working different uh you know different methods mentalities and and values and then going to practice was a whole different step and th thinking through my work through the way it, it architecture is, is is practice and operates in the outside world um and um, but I would say maybe right now it would be mostly the, the years, the early years where I started my PhD, where I kind of locked myself in a room or went back into the cave and immersed myself back again into, into reading and writing. And I felt like even a lot of the things I had learned, you know, a lot of the readings I'd read, you know, the lectures I'd listened to. I never fully grasped it. And then every time I read those or looked at, revisited them, I felt like it, it, I, I, I encountered and understood new things. And, and I would say maybe this version of me is probably uh, that was the, the result of those early years of kind of reading and re writing and re, re immersing myself into that uh, environment. And I, and that's why I kind of decided to continue that and not let let go of it because for me it becomes it became a really valuable uh, kind of a mental place where I could figure myself out, uh, figure what I'm doing, uh, you know, and and understand uh, where I fit into that longer trajectory of in architecture. So, so yeah, so that that's been. That's been my experience. I don't know if that answered your question. I hope it did.